We're happy to have most of our uh, field crew back from Indonesia, Rory and Jim, and I guess some of the students are still there. Tomorrow. Coming back tomorrow. Quick question, Michael. Has anybody introduced Ben Karen, my incoming PhD yes, student? Yes, we introduced him while you were away. Oh, okay, thank you. If you want to introduce him again, you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been done once. I'm sure it was done right. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, today's speaker is our own Eileen Lacey. Uh, Eileen was an undergraduate at Cornell University where she worked with Paul Sherman. Uh, and then she did her PhD at the University of Michigan and then did a postdoc at Davis and then was a Miller postdoc here at Berkeley before joining the faculty where she's been ever since. And uh, I first met Eileen when, don't worry, I'm not going to tell a lot of long stories, <laughs> uh, when we were undergraduates together and we were applying for graduate school. And uh, Eileen was working in a sandwich shop and I went in and bought a sandwich and somehow we struck up a conversation and like all biology nerds started talking about biology and found out that we were both applying to graduate school. So this <coughs> happened at Cornell. I was coming from Berkeley and she was coming from Cornell. We applied to many of the same schools and coincidentally, uh, both ended up at Michigan uh, in graduate school uh, together, where we also coincidentally ended up sharing an office for a number of, of years. Uh, and, <laughs> despite that, she survived and <laughs> uh, still puts up with me. Uh, and who would have thought all these years later that we'd be on the faculty together? Uh, but I've known Eileen as a biologist for many, many years. Uh, when she was a graduate student, she had a large colony of uh, heterocephalus glaber, naked mole rats, uh, uh, which she worked with. She did a lot of work uh, as a graduate student and even as an undergraduate, I imagine, on, on ground squirrels. And she's had a very long-term research project uh, uh, here uh, dealing with tucos. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, she has a colony upstairs that she works with and she also goes into the field. Uh, and so she's part of this tradition of, of field biologists who have established a, a system and stayed with it for many, many years at the same site. And uh, when you do that, you learn things that can't be learned in any other way. It's a, it's a remarkable thing to do, uh, and it requires great uh, perseverance and, and, and insight at work. Uh, and so uh, today she'll tell us about these two posts, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. What kind of sandwich was it? <laughs> it was a turkey sandwich. The best turkey sandwich I've ever had. <laughs> I tried to remember and I never can. Um, do you want to just finish the talk, Michael? You <laughs> so yes, Michael and I have known each other quite a while. I, you kept emphasizing long time and years and years. I'm starting to wonder what, what, yeah. <laughs> In any event, I, part of that, it, it struck a bell because I went back and looked and the last time I gave a museum lunch was 2003. So I figure I'm about on track one more before I retire and I'm good to go. So yeah, it has been a while. All right, today what I wanted to do is kind of catch you up on what I've been doing all this time that I keep disappearing every fall to South America. And after a while you realize there's no way you can fit it all in a 50 minute talk, but I'll do the best I can. I may have to move a little quickly, but the what I want people to walk away with is I started with what I thought was a very simple question and it's turned into an incredibly diverse, rich, long-term program. But before I get started, I want to point out, just because I'll probably forget to this later, the title Tucos, Tohos, and Tocoros. This is a Tuco, that's a Toho, and that's a Tocoro. You clearly see the difference, right? <laughs> Those are just the different local common names for some of the animals I'll be talking about today. I refer to them all as tuco tucos, but the local indigenous languages use slightly different names, <coughs> so that's where that comes from. As I said, I think social media, word of mouth, has perhaps misconstrued a bit what I do when I go to South America every year. I think these are the things that tend to surface on Facebook. I want to emphasize it's all been rodents and nothing but rodents, okay? So, so I am working there, boss, while I'm down there. Um, no, actually, it's been an amazing career that I could not have envisioned at the outset, and it's just worked out to be an incredible experience, all built around studies of these particular animals. Conceptually, <coughs> there have been two questions that I've tried to address over the years. The first, the one that got me started, simply put, is why live in groups? 
that for individuals, even conspecifics, the difference between living alone versus living in a group has incredible impacts on all kinds of aspects of organismal biology. And I'll take you through a few examples of those today. So in other words, this seems like a potentially very simple transition from living alone to living in a group, but it turns out to be very profound, very powerful, and to be the foundation for a lot of the very complex, interesting behavioral phenomenon that behavioral biologists have focused on extensively over the last 30 years or so. So that was the question that got me started. Why live in a group? Over time, the second question that has emerged and has increasingly taken prominence is why do group structures differ? It, you all know as biologists that groups differ in size, they differ in age composition, kin composition, they differ in social structure within the group. And increasingly I'm starting to ask questions about why those differences. So within the general rubric of group living, why do we get different patterns of structure within those groups and can we start to identify some of the predictors of those differences in structure. One thing I've always appreciated about studies of behavior is how interdisciplinary they are. That social structure sits very much at the interface between the field I come out of, ethology, behavioral ecology, field-based studies of free-living organisms, and <coughs> disciplines such as psychology and neuroendocrinology. And part of what's been incredibly fun and rewarding about this line of inquiry has been the chance to begin to really integrate across <coughs> these disciplines, drawing from both sides, both conceptually and methodologically, particularly because, as Michael mentioned, I have a captive colony of Tuco Tucos upstairs, which allows us to start to move into some of these more mechanistic approaches to social behavior that are not easy or not possible in the field. So today, I'm going to focus on a subset of some of these <laughs> themes that we've been working on ecology, evolution, physiology, and a little bit about gene expression. But again, I can't cover it all, and in particular, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> various lines of inquiry about the population genetics, immunogenetics, etc. of this group of animals, the various omics that we're engaged in, uh, a lot of aspects of behavior I don't have time to get into, and increasingly we're looking at how these different species provide evidence of differences in response to climate change or environmental change over multiple temporal scales. So just to give you a sense, it really has spiraled out into an, a, a broad reaching program, not all of which I can cover today, and I'm happy to talk with people individually about some of these other elements. But to go back to the beginning, why <coughs> to go to goes, it really did all start, as Michael mentioned, with naked mole rats. There's an undergraduate at Cornell, just one of those stochastic moments that really shapes your career, changes your career. I stumbled into the opportunity to study captive colonies of naked mole rats at Cornell. It ended up being the basis of my honors thesis. A couple of chapters came of this book came out of the honors work. And really at that point, these were the, the first few years that these animals were in captivity and we were able to study their behavior in detail. And the goal was really just to characterize social structure in captive colonies of these really bizarre animals. So over the course of my undergraduate, early graduate career, we did manage to characterize the social structure. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to these attributes. Mole rats are, of course, group living, both in the field and housed that way in the lab. They exhibit extensive cooperative alloparental care of young. And they're singular breeding, meaning that within one of these groups, there's only one reproductive female and one to a few reproductive males. That was a lot of my work in the lab, kind of the complementary projects going on in Eastern <coughs> Africa at the time, identified what seemed to be the primary ecological correlates of this lifestyle, at least in naked mole rats. And those were sparse and unpredictable patterns of rainfall, hard soils, meaning difficult to excavate soils. These animals dig primarily using their teeth and their jaws. And then finally, patchily distributed kind of superabundant food resources. So at the time, I was starting to think about long-term career plans and trying to identify what I wanted to do. This is where we stood. This was great. It was really exciting. I was really interested in these themes and wanting to explore these further. 
But I also realized that the mole rats, it was getting a little busy out there. First of all, they caught on, you know, with popular media. Um, you know, they've got their own meme and semi, what do I say, subculture going now. And actually, if anybody ever sees this soap, please grab a bar for me. I've never seen it. <laughs> little tongue in cheek here, but yes, mole rats had become popular, and that included more on the science side. Now quite a large team of researchers based in Africa working on field studies of these animals. So that, you know, my desire to maybe do something a little different, coupled with the idea that, you know, what's going on with other rodents? Are some of these patterns we're identifying in naked mole rats, do they apply or to what extent do they apply to other mammals? Got me thinking about other possible study systems that could be exploited, but following on these same basic themes. I decided to look particularly at other subterranean rodents for a variety of reasons, some of which are their remarkable convergence in terms of general life history traits and morphology. That remarkable convergence coupled with at the same time they are nearly worldwide in distribution. They represent multiple phylogenetic origins of subterranean life. And that seemed like it might provide some good opportunities to exploit examples of evolutionary divergence and convergence. So I, that was why I kind of kept my focus on subterranean rodents instead of the entire world to start with. And again, the question I really wanted to ask was, do convergent social structures reflect similar ecological <coughs> factors? In other words, if I could find other examples of group living subterranean rodents, was their ecology or were their ecologies similar to that for the naked mole rats? Well, at the time I was asking this question and trying to get going on this, there weren't many options, okay? The mole rats, as I'd mentioned, the African mole rats were being well studied. The other two potential social subterranean rodents that were known at the time was this animal, the Karuru, member of the family Octodontidae, which occurs in kind of central, central northern Chile and potentially one species of tuco tuco these two are sister families the family tenomyidae as you'll see in a minute the tenomyids are much more broadly <coughs> distributed they're very speciose and for a variety of reasons including those particular opportunities for comparative work i chose to go with the tuco tucos and so just we'll show you selection decided to focus my career on potential convergence um, in behavior and ecology in tuco tucos uh, this audience, more than most, doesn't need this next slide, but I threw it in. Usually I have to at, or answer the question, what is a tuco? Uh, opinions vary. Generational differences here in terms of whether you grew up with Eli Wallach or tuco from Breaking Bad. Turns out in Argentina where I work, tuco is tomato sauce. So, you know, there's a lot of... I want to say packets of you know spaghetti with tuco running around, and then of course the real target here the the tenomaya rodent. A little more biologically, as I've mentioned, tuco tucos are in the family Tenomyidae, single genus in the family, the genus Tenomys, very speciose, 60 plus species currently recognized. This group seems to have kind of explosively radiated, uh, meaning there's not much much depth to the phylogenetic tree within the genus. All tuco tucos are subterranean, meaning they spend virtually their entire lives in underground burrows that they dig for themselves or certainly modify extensively. Geographically, they occur from the southern end of the Amazonian basin down to Tierra del Fuego, except for coastal Chile, where they're replaced by that sister family, the Octodontidae. A little bit of general tuco biology, the, the suspect species when I started, the potential social species, was this one, the colonial tuco tuco, a very appropriate common name that was chosen for it. It turns out that this animal is endemic to a very small region of southwestern Argentina in Patagonia. Uh, if anyone has been to this region, here's the city of San Carlos de Bariloche. This is Neoquen province, Rio Negro province. Uh, this is the largest city in Patagonia, so it's a good landmark. This area all around here is national park land, and this is the entire known current geographic distribution of this species. It's an area of maybe, I don't know, 700 square kilometers, so not very large. Um, 
I happened to learn about these animals through an MVZ connection. <laughs> Penny Pearson, who some of you knew, um, I'm very happy to say that both Anita and Sandy Pearson are here in the audience today. And Anita, in particular, was right there in the field all the time, and really a lot of this work is to her credit as well. But at the time I started this project, aside from informal conversations with Paney and a couple other people, this was the extent of the published literature suggesting that this species was social. You don't need to read it all. The gist of it is you see a lot of these little animals in this particular species popping out of burrows at the same time and sometimes together. And for a tuco tuco, that was pretty weird. And it was enough Paney described the species with a, a former student of his to elect both the specific epithet sociabilis and the common name colonial tuco tuco. But, you know, you think about it, is that a lot to launch a research program based on? <laughs> well, I went for it, and I guess it got lucky maybe more than anything else. Um, but obviously the first thing we had to do was confirm this natural history suggestion that these animals are social. So the first phase of the project was simply characterizing social structure in this colonial tuco tuco. To do this, this is what launched the extensive field project that for 20 plus years now I've gone down to the same study population in <coughs> Patagonia, just north of Bariloche, and employed an extensive mark recapture program. We capture effectively <coughs> everyone in the population. They're all individually marked with a pit tag so that we can follow individuals from year to year and from field trip to field trip. We monitor you know, age, weight, reproductive status, things like that. We also use a lot of radio telemetry that we don't see much of this particular species above ground, but by outfitting adults with radio collars, we can then follow them while they're running around underground and assess spatial relationships, determine who's living with whom, and things like that. So these have been the workhorse methods for this project in the field. Learning to catch these things was an adventure unto itself that I can tell you about offline, but it, we succeeded and we've done this now for a long time. In terms of determining is this species social, the standard criteria for subterraneans are that adults share burrow systems and share nest sites. Now the dogma about subterranean rodents is that most of them are solitary, meaning that each adult lives in its own burrow system. They obviously have to get together to reproduce, but otherwise there is minimal, if any, spatial overlap between adults and certainly no sharing of nests. The heterocephalus, the exception, engage in both <coughs> extensive burrow sharing by adults of both sexes and share a single communal nest. So this was the benchmark or the target we had to assess for these colonial tucotucos. Using our field methods, pretty quickly became apparent that Paney had it right, and that'll be a theme here in this talk. This is just a quick graphic of radio telemetry data from a group consisting of one adult male and two adult females. Each dot represents a different radio fix. The circled number with the star is what was determined to be the shared communal nest. It was later excavated to confirm there was a nest there. And I think even visually you can quickly see that these animals are all using the same space. The quick squiggly shape here was the contours or the boundaries of the burrow system as we determined from <coughs> above ground evidence of active burrow entrances. So even right away in the field with telemetry it was evident that these animals are sharing space <coughs> and sharing nest sites. So good, they're social. Over time we've determined a little bit more about group structure it turns out that a group consists of one to six adult females plus a single adult male. Um, in particular, so that's the gist of it. Groups are multiple adult females and at most one adult male. I'll say a moment, in a moment something about where they come from. The interesting thing I want to point out here because it will be important in a couple minutes is within the study population in any given year and across years we have a mix of burrow systems occupied by just one adult female with or without an adult male, and then burrow systems occupied by these larger groups of adult females. And it turns out that's interesting and informative. Groups form due to natal philopatry by females. Um, approximately two-thirds of females that we recap first capture as juveniles and then recapture as adults are still resident in their natal burrow system. 
In contrast, almost all males disperse from their natal dural system. There always has to be one exception, right? But in general rule, males disperse from the natal dural system. As a result, the groups of females that form are female kin groups. The male, because all males disperse from the natal dural system, the adult male living with a group of females is unrelated, meaning born elsewhere and immigrated into the group. But by following these individuals, over, marked individuals over years, these little gray circles here represent different borough systems. You can see within the local population, each arrow is a dispersal event by a marked male. They're really just shuttling around locally, most of them within the same local population. And that sets up some interesting population genetic themes that I won't talk about today. But basic social structure, female kin group with a single, quote, unrelated adult male. The third point I want to make about social structure, again because this will be important in a moment, is all the females in a group breed. When they're captured in the spring, the breeding season, they're either all pregnant or lactating. Further, if we look at the number of offspring produced by a group, individually, both from looking at sacrificed females as well as lone females, maximum litter size for this species is about six. But yet, if we look at the number of offspring reared by groups of different sizes, we see that that increases. There's a statistically significant increase, and there's no way, for example, that one female could be producing something like 12 to 13 offspring. So evidence that all the females in the groups are breeding. They do all share a single nest, as I mentioned, but they are plural breeding, is the term used to refer to the fact that they're all reproductive. So, having, I hopefully convinced you that this species is group living, the next obvious question to ask as a behavioral ecologist is, do groups matter? Meaning, are there adaptive consequences to living in a group? And I'll run through this rather quickly to show you some of the things we've learned. I'll come back, first of all, to the, we talked a little bit about most females are philopatric, but some disperse. It turns out that's an important difference. The only time in a female's <coughs> life that she will disperse, if she does so, is at the end of her juvenile summer. So in any given season, those young of the year, those young females of the year, some of them will disperse, others will be philopatric. The females that are philopatric that stay in their natal burrow, as yearlings, when they breed for the first time, they will typically live and breed with a group of related female <coughs> kin. In contrast, the females that disperse have to find an unoccupied burrow system. They never join an existing group of females, and thus their first breeding season, they will live and breed alone, meaning without female kin. I mean, obviously there are males involved, but the difference is really in the context, the female kin context. After that first year, as, as juvenile daughters recruit and things like that, the picture kind of equalizes. But that difference in that first breeding season has turned out to be very useful and very informative. First thing to look at, a few measures of fitness. And indeed, if we compare, these are exclusively yearling females. Lone yearling females raise significantly more pups per capita in, in their first season than do group living <coughs> beings. There's a reciprocal kind of trade-off with survival. So the obvious question is what happens over the lifetime, and we don't yet know because we're still trying to establish exact maturity of the pups born in groups. But on a shorter term, certainly whether you live alone or in a group <coughs> impacts your annual direct fitness and your probability of surviving to a second breeding season. So a little bit of evidence that, yes, this difference between living alone versus living in a group has fitness consequences. That same difference also affects physiology. Work done by Julie Woodruff, who many of you know, looked at baseline glucocorticoid levels in free living, lone, and group living yearlings, and found that lone yearling females have significantly higher baseline glucocorticoid <coughs> levels, so a physiological difference in the field. Julie then, using the captive colony upstairs, was able to replicate that experimentally by housing yearling females either alone or with a conspecific and get the same pattern. So a little bit more confidence, or we'll say it allows us a little bit more confidence that it is the social environment, that living alone versus in a group, that makes the difference, as well as this provides us a really nice opportunity to go on and look at other aspects of this 
system in a more experimental manner. But maybe back to the bigger point, whether you live alone or in a group affects your physiology. The direction this is going now, just to give you a little bit of teaser, is following up on that and, you, and now looking at, again using captive animals, how those differences in baseline glucocorticoid levels translate into differences in receptor activity in the brain. Um, this is the gray dots here represent, again, these experimentally group housed animals in the lab versus the red dots are lone females housed alone in the lab, looking at CHRH1, which is one receptor in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the so-called stress axis, and potentially, so potentially something interesting going on. Not necessarily so much between social and lone, but maybe more at the individual level. These are brand new data, and so we're still kind of sorting through it, but some evidence that you know, we can at least look at how does this affect brain chemistry. At the same time, bringing it full circle back to behavior, if we take those same animals and run them through kind of classic psychology paradigm open arena trials to look at exploratory behavior, again, we're seeing potentially some interesting patterns. I won't go into this in detail, but the point being, we can now kind of almost circle back around and having looked at social environment, physiology, neuroendocrinology, we can now come back to behavior and ask, you know, what's going on in terms of underlying this particularly potentially important behavior in the field, how exploratory you are. And this is something that Shannon O'Brien, who just joined my lab, is contemplating getting into, looking into this further and into the causality. So, quick evidence that yes, whether you live alone or with the group affects a bunch of different aspects of the biology of these animals. So to summarize, do groups matter? <coughs> Absolutely, and in all kinds of ways. Well, this leads obviously to the question then, why do those groups form? And I don't mean in this case, you know, natal philopatry as the process by which they form, but really more back to the question that got me into this in the first place, what ecological correlates are there of group living in Tuco-Tucos? And to start, we'll go back to the African mole rats and remind you that the time I got engaged in this research, these were the factors that we thought ecologically contributed to at least group living in naked mole rats. Again, arid habitats with hard soils, patchily distributed food resources, and observationally mobile colonies of animals. The idea, briefly, the argument was that if these large circles are subterranean food resources that these mole rats feed on, an individual living, well, back up a sec, when the soil in this area of eastern Africa where these animals live is dry, meaning between rainy seasons or if rain has not come in a particular year, it's like concrete. It, it really is incredibly hard. These guys can dig through it, but it's not easy. When it rains, there's a period immediately after the rainfall when the soil is soft enough that they can work the soil easily and colonies go crazy digging to excavate or modify, extend their tunnels. So the argument was if you were a lone mole rat living here in this food resource and now it's time you need to find the next food resource, um, when the rain hits and there's that little window of opportunity, you dig like crazy, your chances of finding another food resource before the soil dries up again would be what we're saying, your chances would be low, the probability would be low, whereas if you live in a group, <coughs> your chances of successfully doing that and finding another food resource um, are much higher. And so it's that ecology that kind of constrains individuals to live together, that combination of factors. That was the argument available at the time. I'm more interested in, let's take this list of characters that we think apply to African mole rats and see where we can go with it, beginning with asking, do they work? Do they explain differences in sociality in Tuco Tucos? To do this, I expanded on the system in near Bariloche a little bit. It turns out something I hadn't realized when I started, but again, Painting Pearson had noticed this. If this is the distribution of that colonial Tuco Tuco, this is our study site on the western side of the Limay River. The eastern side is occupied by a different species of Tenomaya, the Patagonian Tuco Tuco, Tenomis hegai, which is solitary. So, set up a study site directly across the river. This is a distance of maybe 300 meters, half a kilometer. Uh, you can see the river here flowing through the Limay Valley. This is Sociabla's side, that's Haygai's side. And use this system to ask how do the ecologies of these two species differ 
given that one's social, one's solitary. <coughs> Cut to the chase, one of the first things we noticed, <coughs> the habitat in this area consists of two basic types. It's primarily arid steppe grassland, seen here in the foreground, that's punctuated in places by these wetter meadows known as magines. That's the local term, but think wet sea or wet meadow. On our two study sites, we need, immediately started to notice that the social species was more or less limited to the wet magine area, whereas the, the solitary species occurred in both habitat subtypes. Minimally, that meant when we collected ecological data for the Patagonian tuco tuco, the solitary one, we had to consider both habitat subtypes. Went through that exercise, summarize a lot of work here. We characterized using microhistology the food resources eaten by both species. No differences in the diet composition, at least for animals living in those wetter machine areas. There were some differences for the solitary ones living in the drier areas, but for any animal living in the machine, the wet area, the diet, there was no difference in diet. Mapped out vegetation, no difference in the distribution of those food resources on either side of the river. So we kind of could rule out some of the arguments about food resources contributing here. Given the setup of the area, rainfall is the same. Not only is it much more seasonable and predictable than in eastern Africa, but given the distances here, you know, if it rains on one side, one study site, it rains on the other study site, so no difference there. You can actually confirm that, right? You stand on one side of the river, is it raining over there? Yeah, it's raining. Right <laughs> but you get the idea. The third thing we looked at were soil conditions, and the only difference here we found was soil hardness, which was actually greater, so harder soils for the solitary species living in the steppe subhabitat, so the reverse of what we would have predicted based on African mole rats. Bottom line, the ecological factors thought to contribute to sociality in those naked mole rats don't work here. Okay, it's, they just, they don't, the same explanations do not apply to these two tuco tucos. Instead, what we think is going on is as we've expanded our spatial sampling and traversed, hiked through large swaths of the Limai Valley, we've really documented <coughs> and increasingly it has become apparent that indeed the colonial tuco tuco is a habitat specialist limited to these mesic patches, whereas the solitary Patagonian tuco tuco occurs everywhere. And increasingly, it looks like it's that different in habitat specialization that sets up quite different spatial distributions of acceptable habitat. And the, the supposition, the hypothesis is that that creates very different costs and benefits for natal dispersal in the two species. So kind of a classic from behavioral ecology, ecological constraints argument uh, on dispersal leading to sociality in the colonial tuco tuco. We're now working to finalize the spatial analyses as well as explore a little bit more the underlying reasons for the habitat specialization by sociabilis. But at least back up a step again at that level of asking, is the ecology of group living the same here as it is with the African mole rats? The answer is no. I want to come back to this comparison then just to remind you this was the list of attributes we thought applied to or characterized African mole rats. If we put up the list for colonial, t it's like dead opposite. You couldn't get much more different, right? Okay, but that's where we are. The other thing I want to put up is just quickly several attributes <coughs> of group structure in each set of animals. Both are group living. That's what's driven the comparisons. Both are kin groups, okay. But whereas those naked mole rats are singular breeding, one reproductive animal per group, the colonial tuco tucos are plural breeding, and I want to emphasize that because that's going to shape very much this kind of third part of the talk. Okay? Um, and so I'll now segue to talking a little bit about variation in social structure in these subterranean <laughs> rodents. When I started in behavioral biology, this was the, the standard dogma or the basic idea that if we could somehow array social complexity along an axis, ranging from solitary taxa to those pinnacles of sociality, the eusocial insects, somehow do that, and people have tried, but I assume we could, this is kind of what it would look like. And, there, you know, people thought this was pretty good, kind of all, you know, variations on a theme here, but the traditional argument was there is some distinction here that separates eusocial insects. It was never clearly articulated what it was, but people really believed in it, some qualitative and presumably quantitative distinction between 
singular breeding and everything else, and those use social insects. Okay, that actually has persisted for centuries, partly as a result of the work with naked mole rats and the realization, and this is why they're so famous in part, they're a eusocial vertebrate, right? They live like honeybees, but they're a vertebrate. A group of folks in the mid-90s proposed, hey, it's really all just a social continuum, meaning the selective factors, the suite of selective factors working here is really the same all the way across that spectrum. They're just working in different combinations or different <coughs> intensities, but there isn't any qualitative or quantitative break in the system. And I confess I was part of the continuum perspective. It's led to a lot of intellectual argument back and forth, and every now and then we dust it off and come back to it. But more recently, say the last five years or so, I've started changing my thinking a little bit. That several lines of evidence that I became aware of, some from a review I did with Paul Sherman on dispersal patterns in social rodents, work done, nice summary review of glucocorticoid physiology in social animals by Scott Creel, and then finally, work on things like neuroendocrine oxytocin receptor distributions in the brains of tuco tucos and African molar rats. This is work that Annalise Beery and I did together. She was a student of Irv Zucker's while she was here. And then a group of um, Bathy Urgent, African molar rat researchers, all suggesting that the differences, the strongest differences that were emerging, or in other words, patterns of dispersal, patterns of glucocorticoid physiology, and patterns of oxytocin receptor distributions all differ markedly between singular breeders and plural breeders. Dustin Rubenstein, who many of you knew, he was a Miller Fellow here for quite a few years, he showed up about the time I was starting to think about this, and we've spent now a long time working on a metadata analysis. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first effort to quantitatively test any of those conceptual <coughs> schema. It's been a long haul, but it's finally now in press. And I'm presenting just a little bit of the data here, but basically we collected information on several hundred social species of vertebrates and invertebrates, and then tried to provide a metric to look at or contrast singular and plural breeders. The statistics ended up being a little complicated, but the gist of it is, if we plot, and I'll just focus on ants here for a second, um, in this case, this is total group size, number of females in a group, versus the proportion of the group that are reproductive. For singular breeders, not surprisingly, there's a very cl tight cluster of societies in which there is only one female, no matter how large the group gets. The more interesting part, and I know I'm moving quickly, so maybe you know, see if you can take it on faith of it for the moment. When we looked at plural breeders, it actually ran regression statistics and generated this gray area as a 95% confidence interval known plural breeding species, the confidence interval for them did not overlap with singular breeding. And in fact, there seems to be an absence of kind of intermediate, they're few, it's biology, nothing's perfect. But it's not a continuous spread of groups with different proportions of breeding and non-breeding animals. And so it really got us starting to think that the big cut is between singular and plural breeding. So in other words, the conceptual scheme we're now proposing is that the break should be here. And rather than being a continuum or the break being between eusociality and everything else, this is the critical distinction. And in fact, it might be that there are somewhat separate suites of selective factors or evolutionary trajectories to get to those two outcomes. So as I said, this is Dustin and I have been thinking about this and kicking this back and forth for a while. Why all of this is relevant to me more directly is if we come back to, for a moment, our good friends by now, the African mole rats, the naked mole rats, and expand to look across what at that time was the family Bathyurgidae. These are all the genera of Bathyurgidae, these African mole rats. Now, currently or recently, it's been argued that heterocephalus should be elevated to family level. One of the co-authors on that paper is sitting here, so he can bust me on my out-of-date phylogeny. But it doesn't affect the argument. These are formerly the Bathyurgidae, African molar rats, now the Bathyurgidae and the heterocephalidae. In red are the social genera, meaning as far as we know, all the species in those genera are solitary, are, are social. The black genera are solitary, and then of course an outgroup. The interesting thing to me was when we expand the picture like this phylogenetically, 
all social bathyurgids are singular breeders, and minimally it looks like we're probably talking at least two origins of that phenomenon. So generalized phylogenetically, they're all singular breeders, and again, the same ecological, ecological arguments have been proposed to explain sociality in all of those <coughs> genera. Well, that was kind of cool. Got me thinking about, what about tuco tucos? Remember that contrast? Naked mole rats were singular breeders. The colonial tuco tuco was a plural breeder. If all African mole rats are singular breeders, what about other tuco tucos? So for the last few years, increasingly, when I'm in the field, I've been checking out other species of tuco tucos. Again, when I started, the dogma was they're all solitary. This is just a cartoon indicating if this is a burrow system. Here's the nest for one animal. You can see a cluster of three animals. And indeed, we had good data for three species that they really were solitary, including that Patagonian tuco tuco. After working with the colonial tuco tuco for a while, okay, they're all solitary and there's this one weird exception, right? Colonial tuco tuco. But I just kept thinking, you know, with over 60 species, it can't really be that simple. And so started asking around, and as word spread, you know, talking with other biologists in South America, turning up reports of other species that might be doing something a little different. And anyway, it's been a great excuse to get back to the field. This is really what I wanted to do anyway. Yeah. Um, and so it's been a great excuse to do that in a, in a scientific context. First stop on the Tour de Tucos was extreme northern Argentina. The colonial Tuco Tuco site is somewhere about here. This is way up on the Argentine-Bolivian border. In fact, if you look, this is raining in Bolivia. I'm in my study site in Argentina, and it's raining in Bolivia. Uh, but this little, tiny little national park, Laguna de los Pozuelos, this species, we caught on to it due to Pablo Cuejo, a longtime colleague of mine based in Mendoza, Pablo's seen here in action. He's actually catching tucos, not sleeping. Um, but in any event, Pablo was on vacation, stumbling around. This is high Andean Puna, right? Saw these things, and I, I still remember the emails, like, you got to get here. <laughs> so we've spent several seasons now at Pozuelos using the same methods to study this species. <coughs> I couldn't get the video to work. This is a video I can show folks afterwards of these things running around foraging. They're, they're uh. Weird for two goes. But in any event, quick answer, yes, they are social. I'll just leave it at that, partly for the sake of time. They, multiple adults of both sexes share nests and burrows. I've jokingly taken to calling them the Berkeley Tuco Tuco because it's a very fluid system. You might share a nest with these individuals for one night and then over here, but they are social by our existing criteria and plural breeding. All females breed, okay? Expansion number one. Expansion number two to Uruguay and tagging, tag teaming with Enrique Lessa, who many of you know. He has studied Tonomis rionegrensis for years, partly because of this color polymorphism and trying to understand the genetics between uh, this normal kind of a goody colored animal and this, this black or melanic animal following up on some of his work and observations that, hey, I catch multiple animals together in the same burrow system. Started working there a couple of years ago. This will be the first stop on my next field season. And indeed, the data are presented a little differently here, but there is regular, meaning on a daily basis, brief social, spatial overlap between adults, no nest sharing, everybody breeds. So you can start to see there's more variation than we thought. The last one I'll mention, the Tocoro, um, oh, I, should, I mistyped the title, it should be Tonomis Peruanus. This was another one of Paney and Anita Pearson's adventures in the, in the high Andean uh, region of Peru. Anita can tell you about the years spent in the school bus. Well, actually, Sandy probably can too. She remembers it. But this species, the Tocoro, Tonomis, it should be Peruanus, just south of Lake Titicaca. I was there in 2000. Nine saw these animals. I'm convinced they're social, and I'm now trying to get the permits to go back and really follow up with the standard live capture and uh, radio telemetry effort. To wrap up, come back to the comparative picture we've been building for Tuco Tucos. It's a lot more interesting and variable than anyone thought, but per, and um, so we've now got a whole range of variants from strictly solitary. Sociablis is the most extremely social but a number of variants in between, and the reports keep coming in. 
put that in a phylogenetic context, this is by no means the complete phylogeny for the genus, but you can see at least how some of these taxa are distributed. Green dots are solitary, red, orange, yellow, kind of the different degrees of sociality, but again the point being it looks like some wonderful opportunities to look at divergence and convergence in behavior. So to close out, come back to this scheme that you've seen now multiple times, the pattern that's emerging is all of the social African mole rats follow <coughs> this strategy, meaning you know this kind of ecology, this kind of group structure, in particular the singular breeding. All of the tenomyids that are group living follow in particular plural breeding. The ecology is a little bit more unknown still. In a sense, what we have right now are two clades that show two different patterns, but consistent within clades, patterns of social structure. <coughs> and the next obvious question is, are there any consistent predictors, or how much is phylogeny versus how much is ecology? And it seems like a really interesting chance to really start to understand when should we get singular breeding versus plural breeding. So the final couple slides here, what's next, Given that situation, basically an N of 1, N of 1, two different phylogenetic clades, two different sets of ecology, two different social structures, it would seem like the ideal would be to somehow have a mix of those things within one species, right, or one lineage, something like that. It doesn't exist in the Tuco Tuco, it doesn't <coughs> exist in the African mole rats, it does exist in Chile. <coughs> This is the Karuru, the other, the third option I had that I passed on when I started all of this. Turns out these animals are widespread in central, central, northern Chile. Northern Chile along the coast, I've studied them in Parque Nacional Frey Jorge. They live in basically what is African mole rat habitat. They eat subterranean plant parts. The colonies are mobile. <coughs> all the African bathyurgid and heterocephalid um, biology but in the mountains east of Santiago, they live in colonial tuco-tuco habitat and ecology. So you can immediately see where this is going, right? If, I, if there's anything to those patterns, the prediction would be the animals in the desert, drier desert habitats, prey for it should be singular breeding. And if there's anything to, again, these patterns, the animals in Gerbaloki east of Santiago should be plural breeding. That's kind of where we've left it for the moment. <laughs> It's looking really interesting, um, mm -hmm. but that's kind of where things stand at the moment. It means a bit of a shift over the Andes into Chile, but these guys at least offer what looks like that variation within, in this case, one species to start to pick apart those patterns a little bit more. So to wrap up, I'm a minute over time. What does it all mean? I started with what I thought was a simple question. It is complicated. Everybody knows that, right? We're all biologists. Um, I think maybe more to the point, even among what seemed at least initially superficially convergent examples of group living in subterranean rodents, there are marked differences in social structure and ecological context. So that superficial convergence actually masks a lot of other richer variation among taxa that share similar life histories and similar biologies in a lot of ways. The third point I guess I'll leave you with is that I'm really excited because the emerging comparative picture for these subterranean rodents, coupled with that kind of conceptual picture that's emerging, that maybe the real difference is in social group structure, singular versus plural breeding, is kind of all coming together. And I think these subterranean rodents, and in particular the Karuru, the Chilean animal, may allow us to really start gaining some traction to understanding what, at least in an ecological setting context, generates those differences in social behavior. So I'll leave you there. I guess I'll talk to you next time just before I retire.